adolescence is a unique period of biological and psychological and social development. Um, it's characterized by very large changes in the brain uh, that continue right throughout adolescence and into the early 20s. It's associated with changes in behaviors, behaviors like risk taking and impulsivity and peer influence peak in adolescence and you can see that across species so not just in humans but in other animals too and across cultures and also across historical descriptions of adolescence um, and it's characterized by social changes so this is the period of life where uh, we are forging our own identities and particularly our sense of social self that is how other people see us um, it's where Adolescents start off with very kind of chaotic social hierarchies uh, and they have to form peer groups and that gradually happens over the whole extensive period of adolescence. And the, ultimately the point of adolescence is to become an independent adult. So all these young people need to go through this prolonged period of development in order to reach full independence. <laughs> I think this research area is very young and so it's probably a bit too soon to draw out hard and fast implications for the classroom. Remember that the experiments we do in neuroscience are you know, in these isolated, highly controlled environments inside a brain scanner often with very controlled stimuli, nothing like the real life of teaching in everyday classrooms. We need to now move from the findings from neuroscience into the classroom in order to see whether the findings that have come out of neuroscience studies apply in real life teaching and learning. But one thing I would say is that um, educating people about the development of the teenage brain is really important. It empowers teenagers to understand about what their brains, how their brains are changing and what that means for their behaviour and their mental health. It's also really useful for teachers. Teachers often find this kind, this kind of information really important because it helps them understand the young people that they're working with. And parents, of course, it's really useful for parents to understand that this period of life is characterized by natural developments at a, at a neural, biological level, as well as hormones, of course, and social changes. It's a really interesting question, and I mean, there are lots of way, there are lots of areas where now the field is ready to move to apply the findings from neuroscience into the classroom. To name a couple, for example, um, sleep. We know that uh, circadian rhythms, the body, the body clock, changes during adolescence uh, because the hormone melatonin that in humans induces sleepiness is produced a couple of hours later in the evening in adolescence than it is during childhood or adulthood. So this means that teenagers are less sleepy in the evenings, they find it harder to go to sleep until later, and they're also much more sleepy in the mornings, they find it really hard to get up. Now this has implications for what time schools should start. At the moment, schools around the globe start really early relative to a teenager's natural kind of night time. Uh, and may, one argument is, well, maybe if school started later and were more in line with the teenager's circadian rhythm, that would result in better educational attainment and socio-emotional well-being. We don't know whether that's true. We know, it, we know the, the hypothesis come, is there and comes from neuroscience studies, mostly in animals. We don't know whether this is true in the classroom. We don't know the consequences of later school start times. There's a big uh, push to look at that question, um, both in the U.S., and also in the UK, led by Russell Foster at Oxford University. It's a really important question and has huge implications for, for schools. Um, other things like, well, we know about um, things like growth mindset and spaced learning and uh, reward versus punishment. We've got a lot of information about how ch adolescents learn best from lab-based studies. We now need to move that into real-life classroom contexts. Yeah, exactly. And I think the key thing is um, that, that neuroscientists and psychologists need to work with teachers and actually with young people themselves in order to carry out these studies.
studies in the classroom. I have no expertise in teaching or parenting, so I can't tell you <laughs> how to teach or parent. But from the neuroscience, uh, does give a lot of insight into what's happening in the brains and the behaviour of young people, and knowing about why adolescents might behave in a certain way, like for example, might be particularly influenced by their peers. Um, and the consequence of that for the decisions they make is, is an important thing to know about, both for um, teachers and parents, but also the young people themselves might find that kind of information useful and why it's happening at a, a neural level as well. I think that's right. It's just too young. This whole, uh, as I was saying in my talk, you know, the whole field of adolescent brain development is only is such a young science it's only been around for really well 20 years absolutely maximum but only really in force in the last decade which in scientific terms is very young so um, it's hard to draw out yeah conclu conclusions for teaching and learning in the classroom at the moment